Hey everyone, it's Michael O'Neill, your friendly Green Party of New York organizer, and this is how Greens can get things done. On this weekly live stream, we talk about all the practical tools, tips, and techniques that Greens can use to get a wide variety of things done, ranging from campaigning for office, building your county organization, uh, working on issue campaigns in your community. And it's a, a broad task that we have before us as Greens. We don't just do elections. We don't just do single issue politics. We don't just do membership training. We do all these things because we're trying to build a political party that can compete and win, take power and change the system to build the kind of society that we desperately need. So there's a lot of things that go into that. So far on this series, we've talked about graphic design. We've talked about how to get on the ballot for office in New York State as a Green. We have talked about how to table and do street outreach. Today, we're gonna talk about something that is a little more on the abstract side of the spectrum. I mean, believe me, there are direct applications to this, but we're gonna be talking about more than just, you know, how to design a flyer right, or how to create a petition and get signatures to get on the office, uh, uh, to run for office. We're going to be talking about power structure analysis. And what do I mean by power structure analysis? Well, I'm a big fan of an organizer and writer named Jane McAlevey. And uh, boy, if, if you're a green and you've ever spent more than five minutes with me, then you've probably heard me bring up Jane McAlevey. And she's got two books out that I'm, I'm a big fan of. One is called Raising Expectations and Raising Hell. The other is called No Shortcuts. And in both of those books, and also in lectures that she's put up on YouTube and on her site, at uh, her, her Jane McAlevey personal site, which you can easily find just by plugging that into your preferred search engine, she talks about her time in the uh, union movement as a union organizer and her time being able to apply kind of old school uh, Congress of Industrial Organization style, uh, pre-McCarthy era, um, radical, you know, whole worker organizing, militant worker organizing, tools and tactics that she learned from her time at 1199 SCI, uh, SCIU New England. Uh, and these whole worker organizing, uh, organizing versus mobilizing tools are how she and the workers that she was organizing with were able to win victories in Nevada, which is a right to work, AKA right to work for less state in the 2000s during a time when a lot of unions across the nation were getting their teeth kicked in and are still getting their teeth kicked in. And she attributes power structure analysis along with other tools and tactics that we can talk about in future episodes with how she and uh, her local and unions like the one that she worked with in Nevada. It was a, a SCIU uh, nurses union, hospital staff union, how they were able to win real victories and not just on increasing wages, but how workers were able to have some control over their own work schedules. So if you wanted to swap a shift with someone on your floor, you could do that without the boss's permission you know, within you know, certain guidelines to make sure you're not you know, going over you know, unsafe hours per week or whatever, but, um, but still that you know, within certain parameters, you could swap a shift and, and your boss doesn't even need to know about it. These are not just monetary wins uh, within the workplace, but wins where workers are able to exercise greater autonomy and work with greater dignity. So how was she able, how was the union that she worked with, I should say, able to uh, win these kinds of victories in a, you know, at that time, pretty solidly red state, a uh, not a union friendly state outside of the um, casino and hospitality workers within Las Vegas? How were they able to win these things? Well, one of the tools is power structure analysis. And the goal of power structure analysis is to say, what do I want to accomplish? What do we want to accomplish? And how much power do we need to 
accomplish that change that we want to see, whether it's passing ranked choice voting or a single payer healthcare system. Who do we have that is in favor of that change we want to accomplish? Who is opposed to this thing that we want to accomplish? And what is the relative amount of power that each of those groups have? Because to get what you want, to accomplish the change that you want, you're gonna need more power than the other side. And it doesn't matter if you're right. It doesn't matter if you've got great language on your flyer. It doesn't matter if you've got a lot of Twitter followers or you put out a lot of memes. What matters is how much power that you have to apply to the thing that you want to happen. And I think that's something on the left that is difficult for us to grapple with because I think that we're a bit phobic about power. I, we are afraid that power corrupts, right? Uh, we certainly don't like what the people who currently exercise power in our society have done with it. And so that makes us apprehensive about talking about power and trying to exercise power and gather power in a assertive way. We're not used to thinking in that way. And, and we understand on some level that if we are going to try to build power and exercise power, then that demands a great deal of responsibility from us. And that's where the pillars of you know grassroots democracy and social justice and things like that come into it. Those are checks on exercising power in a you know purely selfish or authoritarian way. So what is power? Power is the ability to uh, make changes in the world, make things happen in the world at the most abstract level. And uh, you need to have it if you want to make those changes happen, especially if those changes are against the dominant political, social, economic paradigm. People aren't just going to realize that you're correct and that you've got a great idea and, and then just put it into practice. Um, as the great Fre Frederick Douglass said, power concedes nothing without a man. Uh, without a demand, it never has and it never will. Uh, so we need to have uh, our demands, and then we need to have the uh, counter power, the people power necessary to uh, exact those demands. So power structure analysis is a way of systematically looking at power within a specific context, within whatever it is that you want to win in the arena in which you want to win it. And it provides you with step-by-step uh, -step ways to break down that question of how much power do we need to win this thing? who has the power uh, to help us win this, and what is the array of entities that are opposing us, and how much power do they have. All right, so I was introduced to this concept uh, through Jane McAlevey's work, as I already said. She references a gentleman by the name of Anthony Thigpen, uh, who works out in the West Coast, and he's a longtime organizer, strategist, movement educator. And through some very obsessive Googling, I was able to track down some presentations about power structure analysis that go into the nuts and bolts of this process a little bit more than Jane McAlevey does in her books. Although I highly recommend that you, again, read Raising Expectations and Raising Hell and No Shortcuts. Those are both essential reading. And if you're not ready to get those books, look her up on YouTube and check out her Building Power to Win lecture and she also did a lecture to the yes lab so you can google jane mcalevey yes lab and that'll come up those are mostly about organizing versus mobilizing which is maybe something we can talk about another day but uh this power structure analysis that mcalevey and uh, organizers like her have used is adapted from this anthony thigpen model and uh, it uses some visual tools to plot out on a spectrum of uh, opposition versus ally and power versus not a lot of power. And I'm going to show you what that looks like right now. So let me just uh, transition my uh, magic camera here so you can take a look at my workstation. All right, so basic assumptions of power. And again, this is a, a, a presentation that I was able to find online 
and uh, the website that I found it was called union1.org, union and the number one.org, and it's no longer online anymore. These are admittedly uh, somewhat old presentations on it. The version of power structure analysis that Comrade Thinkpen and his uh, colleagues and and you know people who have learned this, they might be teaching a different version of it at this time. This is the version that I've been able to get my hands on, and I think it's a good place to start for us. But actually, before I get into the analysis, I wanted to read this little quote from uh, Jane McAlevey's Raising Expectations and Raising Hell. The concept of the power structure analysis originated in community organizing. You identify the real power players in a given community area, determine what the basis of their power is, and find out who their natural allies and opponents are. Based on that knowledge, you formulate a plan for enhancing the power of your allies and neutralizing that of your opponents. And then she goes on to talk about uh, Anthony Thigpen, uh, who you know, worked in, has worked in Los Angeles. And uh, you measure power both in absolute terms and in relation to specific goals, right? Like what is it that you want to win? It's a political education tool, right? Walking your Green Party members or even just yourself through a map of who actually like pulls the strings in your community or within your neighborhood organization uh, or within your workplace or within your union local or within your food co-op, right? Power relations are everywhere. And if you have a thing that you want to achieve within an organization or within a, a context, and there are people who oppose that vision, then you've got some power structure analysis to work out. And maybe you're working at that out so that you, know, you can achieve a form of compromise or a form of mutual understanding, or maybe you just need to get elected to an officership within that organization or have an ally elected to that organization so that you can get what you want. And uh, again, I think that these are terms that sometimes we are uncomfortable speaking in because we would like to believe that um, there is no real opposition, that it, there's just people who uh, haven't seen the light yet. They, they haven't heard the policies that we have to offer. They aren't aware of the benefits that they would bring. And to an extent that that's true, but there are also people who just have real either disagreements with what we want to achieve or what we want to achieve is going to uh, remove a portion or all of their power, their status. It's going to materially impinge upon you know, either their, their profits or their status and they don't want that to happen. And so uh, then we got to get to work. So there's a quantitative phase and a qualitative phase to power structure analysis. The quantitative phase is looking at the um, institutions and uh, power players and kind of ranking how much power that they have. And then the qualitative phase is, tends to be more focused on interviewing your own people, right? Uh, your own members and, and mapping out their relationships to allied institutions or potentially allied institutions in your community. Places of worship, recreational organizations, neighborhood associations, local unions, uh, uh, single issue groups like environmental societies or um, uh, immigrant rights groups uh, or civil rights groups. So uh, in, in the quantitative phase, also you're looking at like, you know, how much money do these uh, groups that you're opposed to, how much do they, ha do they have to spend? Uh, how many people belong to them? Um, how many of them are there? Uh, how, many of, how many elected officials are allied with them? And you want to make that as concrete as possible. And the qualitative aspect is more about seeing the social connections between people, generally more at an individual level. All right, so Let's see if there's anything else worth uh, highlighting here from this uh, extract from Jane's book. Well, just that this was always kind of her first step, whether she was doing um, worker organizing in New England or in Nevada, or if she wanted to, if the union wanted to elect someone to office, or if there was a particular bill that they wanted to pass, or even just looking at an employer that they were in a union drive and saying, okay, 
you know, who who are are these people's allies? Who is against them? Uh, how can we bring allied institutions on board in support of our workers? So moving on to the actual uh, power structure analysis uh, step by step. All right, so basic assumptions of power. Power relationships are unequal, and this is the key cause of the uh, problems that we ourselves are trying to change. The relationship between fossil fuel companies and the corporate state that backs them, that there's an unequal amount of power between them and everybody else who is saying that we need radical, fast, dramatic action to stop climate change. There is a, an unequal balance of power there, and it is our job to uh, fight to correct that in order to get what we need. We have to develop strategies to address this inequality of power. And strategy applies to what you do, but it also describes what you don't do. And sometimes when I talk to Greens about campaigns, uh, campaigns for office, they say, well, I wanna reach everyone. Well, you're not gonna be able to reach everyone. Trying to reach everyone is like trying to boil the ocean to make a cup of tea. You need to be strategic about who you spend your limited time and energy reaching out to so that then those people that you reach can reach more people on your behalf as part of your campaign. It's strategic. We uh, need a systematic way of understanding power and how it is exercised uh, to organize more workers, change labor laws, and create substantial wins for the working class. Now, like I said, this is adapted from a kind of union context. So a lot of this is gonna talk about uh, workers and unions, but it is just as applicable to uh, the work that we're doing in the Green Party. We are a party of, of working people. We are a party of the community. And so this, is, this all lines up. So types of power analysis, strategic power analysis, you want to analyze the landscape of a defined region, including key problems, conditions, decision makers, what are the current major battles, uh, who are the primary opposing forces, organize progressive forces that are you know, either potentially allied with you or who are currently aligned with you in struggle. And then important unorganized social groups. So what are constituencies that you can identify that currently do not have organized representation or an organized uh, structure that they're working within, but that could be implemented and they could be a potent force uh, in favor of whatever it is that you're trying to achieve. Campaign power analysis is about decision-making targets, key battles, organized opposition, organized support. Now this is kind of more referring to like an issue campaign or a union campaign, but you can also think of it applying to an electoral campaign as well in terms of, you know, within the confines of this election for this amount of time, who are the decision makers that we need to reach? Uh, what constituencies do they have sway over? Uh, what are the major issues that have been a problem for the people that you're running against? Uh, where are they weak? Where are they strong? All that stuff. Corporate power, power analysis, analysis of a of a specific corporation, doing a deep dive on one corporation. And that would be looking at their stockholders, finances, current lawsuits, who do they donate to politically, et cetera, et cetera. So the steps. First, you want to define the major issue or problem. So let's say we want to abolish opportunity to ballot in New York State, or we want to pass single payer health care in New York State, or we want to implement ranked choice voting uh, within a town or a city or across the state. Uh, in, in this example, they're talking about affordable housing. Um, you want to define the competing agendas surrounding the problem. What's our agenda? What is the opposing agenda? And having a clear uh, version, well, let me take a step back, right? Because I think I actually leaped to number two. Define the major issue or, or problem. The major issue or problem uh, in the examples I was just talking about is that uh, people cannot afford health care in New York State, or they can only afford health care that doesn't really cover them. Voter turnout is abysmally low in New York State or and across the country. Our voting system is structured to discriminate against third parties and independent candidates in New York State and across this country. 
that's the major problem, right, uh, within those arenas, if you're talking about electoral justice or healthcare or what have you. Then the competing agendas would be, okay, for our agenda, we want to implement ranked choice voting or we want to abolish um, opportunity to ballot that allows people to raid our ballot line, or we want to institute single-payer health care. Their agenda is they want to keep things the way they are. Um, maybe there's a kind of quasi-liberal campaign for open primaries, which would actually lead to more raiding of the Green Party ballot line in the context of fusion and opportunity to ballot, um, or you know, any number of, or uh, a, uh, you know, in the case of healthcare, a, you know, maybe just keeping things the way they are, or just trying to take the least worst option that they, that the power structure sees as available from the, you know, Donald Trump care initiative. Those would be competing agendas. It's, it's the opposing perspective, the opposing desire. Then you want to identify the major decision makers, right? So who actually has to make the decision to um, put forward what you want? In the case of single-payer health care, it's going to be a vote from the state assembly, the state senate, and then signing off from Andrew Cuomo. All three of those things have to happen if we want single-payer health care to get passed in New York State. So uh, we got it passed in the state assembly, has not passed in the state senate, and uh, even when that happens, you're still going to have to get Governor Cuomo to, to sign off on it. In the case of implementing ranked choice voting, uh, you could do a petition initiative in your town or city to try to amend your town or city charter. Uh, but you're going to have to get the city council to, uh, well, they have to look at it. They may not sign off on it. But uh, your mayor it, within your town or city may be able to uh, squelch your petition by calling a charter revision committee, which would essentially nullify your petition. So you've got to get the people to sign your petition and back your petition. And then you, got to, you have to keep your mayor from uh, squelching your petition and allowing it to come up for a referendum vote. And then you have to go through the actual campaign of getting the votes that you need in your referendum. So in the case of ranked choice voting, if you're talking about getting that through amending a town or city charter, the decision makers include the city council, the mayor, and then eventually the people that you uh, need to vote for it within a referendum campaign. And then the people that you the, that you need to help mobilize those constituencies to vote. Sketch the major issue or policy battles related to your major problem. So if you're talking about affordable housing in general, then there might be specific zoning battles about affordable housing that are going on within a community. Uh, there might be a fight about rent control fight, or there might be a, a block of pub public housing that's about to be privatized or, or just destroyed. In terms of uh, major policy or issue battles regarding electoral reform, again, there are rumblings about open primaries in New York State. Uh, within uh, single-payer health care, there's a lot of concern about uh, Trump care at the national level. There's uh, Medicare for all legislation at the federal level. And then there's the current New York health bill at the state level. And that's what we're fighting to get passed. So steps in strategic power analysis. Uh, this is the kind of the, the back end of that. You want to identify the organized opposition. Who are the actual groups that have a letterhead and a website and a bank account that are opposing what you want? Uh, maybe it's specific elected officials. Maybe it's probably specific elect elected officials and the lobbyists and or corporations who are contributing to that elected official. You want to identify uh, organized pro-working people groups, uh, pro-Green Party groups, allies and potential allies. So the New York Health Campaign is a coalition of allies that want to see single-payer health care passed. And you can you know, look at the broad constellation of those allies and, uh, and other allied groups that maybe haven't necessarily joined that coalition but nevertheless are, are fighting for the issue. And then you want to identify key sectors or groups that are not part of organizations. So if you're talking about affordable housing, then, you know, tenants of, of low income housing uh, who may or may not have a tenants association, uh, different constituencies based on uh, race, on gender, on sexual orientation, on gender expression, any number of um, kind of social markers that we might be used that we might be able to use to identify groups of people 
who have an interest in this fight, but are not formally being represented currently. And then once you assemble all those things, you and uh, assemble the picture and then try to create strategies for changing the equation so that it's in your favor to maximize your strengths and minimize your opponent's weaknesses. So this is an example of what a, um, a very basic power analysis grid might look like. And it's an attempt to visually represent the different concepts that we've been talking about. What do you want to happen? Who has the power to make that happen? Who is opposing that and how much power do they have? Who is in favor of what you want to happen and, and how much power do they have? So there is an X and Y axes here. And on the X axes, the horizontal axes, we are mapping support or opposition for or against what you want to happen. So in, in this example, we're talking about union built affordable public housing, public sector housing and rent control. That's what we want. On the opposing side, they want housing program cuts, demolish the current public housing stock. They want non-union construction and uh, they want to you know, demolish uh, currently affordable housing to build high-end housing that you know, no one can afford except for super, super rich people. So those are the, the opposing ends of that horizontal axis. And then in the end, or in the middle, the competing agenda for positions, policies, etc. Now on your Y axis, you've got uh, the amount of power that groups or individuals have. So on the bottom end of the spectrum, you've got people who are not even really on the radar. And those are gonna be uh, most likely unorganized groups. And then going up, you've got groups that can get attention, but are not maybe necessarily um, consistently able to influence decision makers. Then you've got people who are taken into account by decision makers. Then you've got people who have major influence on decision making. So maybe someone who has the ability to actually remove someone from office or make it very difficult for someone to retain their office or get reelected to office. Someone on whom a reelection might depend on uh, for like a formal endorsement or contributions or whatever. And then you've got people who are active participants in decision making. So that might be um, someone who's like actually on a decision making body, like a legislature or a housing association board or uh, someone connected to those people. Maybe someone who's, who's drafting the report that gets sent to those people. Uh, and then decisive decision making power or influence. So when, when we get the New York Health Act passed in the um, assembly in the state Senate, Governor Cuomo or whoever's the governor at the time will have decisive decision making power. That person will have the, the power to sign the bill or not. And so they're on the uh, higher end of the spectrum. So on the uh, left end of the spectrum is uh, diehard support for what we want. On the right end of the, of the spectrum is diehard opposition to what we want. On the bottom end of the y-axis is uh, people who like really don't even register in the conversation. And then at the top end are people who have a uh, very clear decision-making power. And so if you plot different potential groups on this, then visually you can see if you're talking about affordable housing, then union locals, labor councils, grassroots organizations, uh, these are groups that are broadly in support of the issue that we're talking about. And they kind of range from maybe not being super visible to the decision makers to uh, consistently being taken into account depending on the kind of organization. And then uh, on the issue of like, if it, well, on the issue of uh, affordable housing, your local city council, right, uh, will be on the upper tier of, of decision making power. And some on the city council uh, will probably not have as much influence on this particular issue. A uh, fewer number of people on the city council will have more decisive control if they're heads of uh, committees or things like that. And then some people in the council might be, you know, very much opposed to this issue. 
and then some people might be more leaning towards the middle. And that's probably the best we can hope with a lot of our elected officials at, at this point. Even though they might talk a good game when it comes to actually doing something that goes against the interests of real estate and finance and, ins and you know, insurance companies, then you know, they, they're not going to do the work. Then uh, further to the right of uh, the diehard opposition, you're going to have maybe the local chamber of commerce. And they're not going to have as much power as the city council on this issue, but they still have a pretty big chunk of power because they're the ones who contribute to uh, corporate officials getting elected. They're the ones who are, you know, pushing for different, you know, zoning uh, modifications to put in, you know, economic engine kind of projects for uh, so-called development. So that's an example basic power analysis grid. And you can apply this format to almost anything, whether you're talking about, um, you know, uh, elections for uh, your, your housing co-op or, um, you know, who, who's the captain of your baseball team if, if you have elections for that. I mean, it, it, it's, it's a very um, comprehensive way of addressing questions of uh, competing agendas and how to map those out and then how to eventually tackle them. So in the steps to develop a strategic power analysis, step one, like we talked about, you define the major problems, sketch the competing agendas, those go on the boxes uh, here on the left and right, sketch the major decision makers, that might include board of supervisors, city council, state legislature, sketch the major organized opposition, sketch the major issue and policy battles, and uh, analyze the picture, uh, sketch the organized progressive groups. I skipped a couple steps there. So you sketch the, the opposition, the organized progressive groups, then the unorganized social sectors, and then analyze the picture and develop strategies for how to change these equations, which frequently will probably involve getting unorganized people organized or doing everything that you can to leverage a greater amount of organizations that are in favor of what you want to counterbalance and overcome the organized opposition, which is probably fewer groups and f that represent fewer numbers of people, but those people disproportionately have more power behind them. All right, strategies for changing the equation. Like I said, increasing our power. So organizing, increasing our numbers. So that's you know, or taking the unorganized and turning them into organized constituencies. Mobilizing our base. So those people who are nominally part of organized uh, institutions, they need to be turned out. They need to get off the couch and they need to make phone calls or show up to meetings or uh, contribute in, in one way or another, volunteer, go door to door. Uh, help organize those who are not yet organized. Building stronger alliances between organized institutions uh, and groups so that we are working with each other more effectively. Uh, developing our leadership to, to increase the capacities of our own groups so that uh, we can more effectively wield the power that we have. Using creative and escalating tactics, uh, ranging from creative protest to uh, disrupting a... Um, rent guidelines board meeting or uh, you know using social media to help raise awareness of, a, of an issue uh, writing letters to the editor to you know to put our message out there and and then escalating those tactics to make the powerful uncomfortable and make their position untenable countering neutralizing the power of our opponents exposing their vulnerabilities using secondary targets uh, finding people who can influence our opponents and applying pressure through them. Sometimes the indirect approach is, is the best way to do it. Now, there's a, an implication to this power structure analysis that I think is really important. And Jane McAlevey talks about it a lot in her work. And I think it's important for us to talk about, not just in the context of issue campaigns, but also for elections. So you can think of an equation the cost of, of the demand to the power structure plus the power of the opposition who don't want it to happen equals 
the power that we need to win the fight. So if the demand is relatively small, then even if our opposition have a lot of power, we maybe won't need a lot of power on our end to win it because the cost of the concession to the enemy is not that great. It's just not going to be worth their time to put up the fight. They're going to grant it because it doesn't really cost them anything. Now, if you have a demand that is very costly, but there's not that many people um, in power who oppose it, then, um, then again, the power that you need uh, won't necessarily be that much because uh, your the opponents to the idea is uh, relatively small, so you're going to be fine. Now, uh, but if if the if the cost of your demand is high, and there's a lot of power in the opposition, then uh, you need a lot of power to win that fight. And to apply that to elections, uh, getting a green elected to a school board. Uh, you know, a relatively, you know, that's not a position that's super costly to the existing power structure, right? In a uh, relatively, you know, uh, progressive or liberal area where green ideas are not considered that threatening, that might not need as much power behind that campaign to win as a campaign for mayor of a, you know, relatively large city in a area where you know the right wing or you know reactionary wing or even just the the democrat party is uh, very strong and very organized and where they are um, committed to not letting greens get that first partisan election win on their own so think about that and and the, it might, maybe it sounds just too obvious, right? But on the other hand, I think that we as Greens fall into this trap frequently of that, like, we're just going to win on the basis of our intentions and on the righteousness and clarity of our message and, and or just on, like, sheer will. And that just isn't how it works. We are in a competition when we're in an election, and it's not a fair competition. It's one that's been designed to exclude us. And so we have to marshal and, and be really realistic, brutally realistic, maybe even verging on cynical regarding on the amount of power and influence and effect effectiveness that we need to marshal and organize together in order to get that victory. Uh, because it's it's not it isn't a fair fight right and um you know when we're only getting one percent of the vote we're not as much a threat as when we're getting 48 percent of the vote or 49 percent of the vote and that difference between 49 percent of the vote and 51 percent of the vote might take more effort and more strategy and more skill on our part than the the 48 percent of the vote that we won leading up to that point because it's that last that last margin that is the greatest threat to the existing power structure. We have to be realistic about that. The good news is that we can do this, right? We can build a uh, you know broad, powerful party that is owned by our members and run by our members and is radically democratic and committed to the four pillars and and, and is a force for good in our communities. But it's going to take a lot of work. And it's going to take a lot of learning and training and learning between each other and amongst each other and talking to people that we've never talked to before and helping them get organized and training them up, them up and using the numbers that we have out there who, who are in favor of our policies, but getting them organized and getting them working towards this to uh, overwhelm the opposing powers and, and structures. So for greens, we can use power structure analysis to uh, broaden our knowledge within our existing county organizations and locals regarding the communities in which we operate. Who's pulling the strings in our communities? Where are the bodies buried, so to speak? This is important for us to know. It can be super boring and super dry and you're not going to become a Twitter superstar researching, uh, you know, who the major players on your neighborhood 
uh, representative board is. But this is the essential work towards building a party and building movements that can actually win things, really win things, and win things even when the people in power don't want us to have it. This can be used for candidate identification. You can, you know, map uh, you know, what are the existing organizations that maybe we've been working with or allied with and what are the issues that mean the most to those organizations? How much, how much influence do they have to exercise? We can use that when we're trying to recruit candidates from social movements and from organizations. You can use it to analyze districts and counties to analyze campaigns. Uh, who is weakest, that, who's up for re-election? What are the forces that are arrayed against those people? What are the issues on which those candidates are weakest? And who are the organizations that are in support of those issues? And also we can just do it in terms of member organizing. You can use it to uh, chart registered greens in our electoral districts. Now this gets into the more qualitative side of power structure analysis. And this gets into creating almost like an ethnography of the social connections that our Green Party members have. What social institutions are they linked to? What groups of people are they linked to? How much influence do they have among those groups and institutions? And where do those groups and institutions sit in regards to opposition or support for the issue that we're fighting for? So, uh, where do we want to go from here? Um, we need to increase our research capacities because it is through research that we're able to do that kind of quantitative objective, objective power analysis of who's donating to whom, uh, who's in support of whom, how, much, uh, how many people do they have, all that kind of stuff. What have they been up to? And there's a website called datacenter.org that I recommend checking out. You can go to datacenter.org and they have these toolkits, and it's, it's research for the people. And it, it walks you through uh, grassroots research techniques that you can use, making uh, use of publicly available archives of information, libraries, things like that, to try to get the data that we need to make informed assessments of power structures in our communities. And they refer to this as research justice. And unfortunately, this program, I think, closed recently, but the toolkits are still online and they're still very, very useful. Uh, and there's examples on you know, environmental justice research that's been done, you know, community-driven research, what is research justice, case studies. I highly recommend you check it out. This is a great area for people who want to get involved in the party to do a deep dive on this stuff. This is a skill that is just as needed as people who are able to give public speeches or people who are able to do graphic design or people who are able to work as candidates or treasurers. This kind of uh, grassroots research is really important for us to be able to make strategic assessments about uh, what issues should we emphasize, uh, and how they can help us win, who are the groups and institutions that will back us on those issues, and uh, who is the opposition, and what are their weaknesses. So datacenter.org, uh, an important resource for um, increasing our research capacity as Greens. Uh, a membership interview schema. Now, what do I mean by that? When I was talking before about trying to figure out what are the social and political links that our Greens have, our rank and file Greens, our Green officers have to the rest of the community. You basically do like an interview with yourself or an interview with another Green to say, okay, what groups do you belong to? Whether it's social groups, religious groups, uh, trade unions, volunteer organizations, uh, civil rights groups, environmental groups. These are networks that you're plugged into, whether you realize it or not. And we can make use of those networks because those people know you they trust you. you. They've seen you do good work. They've seen you, you know, work in solidarity with whatever their aims are. And when you talk to them, it's going to have more um, impact than, than them just seeing a flyer or talking to someone that they don't know. And as you do that kind of organizing within the groups that you have access to, then those groups themselves can come on board as organized support for whatever it is that we're trying to achieve. 
uh, developing ways to sort and store research, right? So you do that research on the groups and you know, how, how do you archive that in a way that it's useful, in a way that it's then able to update later on? Because these pictures of power dynamics are always changing, and we have to do what we can to stay up to date to make sure that our assessments are still current. We need to practice this among our green leaders and with rank and file greens, uh, and, you know, potential subjects. Uh, I've been talking about the New York Health campaign, campaign for 100% clean energy. That's a, you know, a, a massive campaign to look at, you know, what's the current lay of the land regarding who's in support of what measures, you know, who's trying to bail out nuclear power plants, who's pushing for offshore wind. Let's, uh, you know, have as concrete and clear perspective of that as possible. All right, I guess, oh, um, right, so charting. I talked about the more qualitative side of uh, working with greens. So there's the greens that you know, and then um, the process of charting and the visual that you're looking at right now is an example of charting a workplace. And when a union tries to go and organize a, a workplace, or even when an a workplace is organized, they create these big visual wall charts where they have everyone's name, where do they work within the business or within the institution, how committed are they to the union, and uh, what are their you know, current issues or challenges or strengths. They actually you know, map this out. And uh, in a moment, like uh, you can see, this is like an actual map. So this is an example map of a middle school where you actually put out, okay, which classroom is each teacher stationed to? And are they a member? Are they a potential member? So you could look at your list of registered greens and on a you know, big map of your neighborhood and actually write out, okay, um, who's a registered green? Of those registered greens, who has actually talked to us? Who's actually like really supportive of the party? Who's willing to get involved? Who's already involved? Uh, who still needs to be reached out to. These are ways of systematically and strategically organizing the data that we have in such a way that we can act on it and that we can act on it over time. We're not gonna get it done all at once, but we have to go at it one step at a time. And the more that we can put the information that we do have in easy to look at ways, like a diagram, like a chart, then the more creative we're going to be and the um, more strategic we'll be able to be uh, regarding how we go about organizing those people. And then once you have those people plugged in and you have actual connections to them, then you can start charting, okay, so what are their social relationships? Do they attend a place of worship? Do they volunteer? Are they currently in school? Uh, where do they work? Um, if they're, uh, you know, what, what family do they have in the area? What, uh, you know, have they ever been involved in political activity before? Putting all of these things in, a, in a, a chart or a database of sorts then helps us be able to recognize power that we probably didn't really know that we have. And that's kind of the great truth is, right, is, as uh, Dr. Jill Stein was fond of quoting during her campaign is, um, you know, the, the quickest way or the easiest way to get people to give up power is, is to make it so that they, they don't even know that they have it, right? And we don't realize how much power that we actually have. And it, by going through the steps of these kinds of processes, whether it's a self-interview to really write out, like, okay, who do I know in this city? What are they linked to? What institutions do they work for? Do they serve on boards of or that they volunteer for? really writing that out, you get a much better sense of um, what kind of networks you can leverage as opposed to just trying to think of it all in your head. And you'll never really be able to get a, a full sense of the picture that way. And that means that you're not going to be able to leverage power that you otherwise could have. And as I talked about, for the things that we are fighting for and the fierce opposition that we're confronting, we need all the power we can get. We cannot afford to leave it on the table. So that is uh, a, uh, 
a rundown on power structure analysis. And uh, it's uh, I've been going for about 50 minutes here, so not as bad as the graphic design episode, but a little longer than I wanted to. And maybe this is an issue we can revisit in the future. Uh, right now on screen, I've just got a um, a uh, this this is kind of like a like a step by step um, kind of walk through of, of filling in the the different parts of of the power analysis grid. We are working to organize these live streams on the gpny.org site. Uh, I will make available uh, PDFs of this uh, presentation that I've been reviewing with you on the Facebook post for this video. I'll post it in the comments. And then also these uh, resources for all of the um, live streams will be available on the archive page when we get that up and running on gpny.org. I wanna thank you again for watching How Greens Can Get Things Done. Again, my name is Michael O'Neill. If you have questions about this or any of our other live streams, you can email me at michael at gpny.org. Again, that's michael at gpny.org. Please share this to your fellow Greens, to your Green Party uh, county organizations, uh, caucuses that you might belong to. I think these are some pretty useful tools that I feel uh, very lucky to have stumbled across and I'm really happy to pass them on. I hope that you find them helpful. Please leave your questions and comments uh, in the comment section for this live stream or you know, feel free again to email me at michael at gpny.org. I'm your friendly Green Party of New York staff organizer and this has been How Greens Can Get Things Done. Thanks so much for watching and I look forward to seeing you again a week from now at 4 p.m. Eastern time. I hope you have a lovely weekend, uh, rest of your weekend, and uh, see you in the streets.